So I'm going to be talking about emergency medicine, leaning forward. We're really going to talk about the future of emergency medicine and where we need to be in the next five years. It's kind of a 30,000 foot level, but if we don't start looking at getting into value-based, emergency medicine being more value-based, we're going to have legislators, the government, um, and the payers tell us not only trying to take patients out of our emergency department, but they're going to be telling us how to practice emergency medicine. So we, we really must be more proactive and, and look at how we can become more value-based. So what's the case for emergency medicine? Well, in the last 25 years, or last 20 years, our, our emergency department visits have gone up 30%. At the same time, we've lost about 25% of our emergency departments. Now, that's not quite a fair depiction because most emergency departments, if I asked people in here who, who have had their emergency department renovated in the last five or 10 years, just about all of you would raise your hands because we've all expanded. We're bigger, we're busier. But in 2009, the data, we had 136 million visits. Now, we just got, a couple weeks ago, the 2010 data, which shows our, our ED visits dropped to about 130 million. We're going to have to watch that because, as I said, we're, they're going to be looking at, the government and payers are going to be looking at ways they can get patients out of your emergency department, and that's not necessarily good for emergency medicine. So I'm going to show, I'm going to tell you some ways that we can try to improve that and maintain our business and maintain our importance in medicine. So here's the real story here, and you've all seen this, spending on health care. Uh, whether it's uh, the average spending per capita or percent of gross domestic product, that top line is the United States, and we're way above every other country. And we cannot continue this and maintain this and be an economically viable country. Right now, we're at 18 percent of gross domestic product. That's going to go up to 20 percent. Medicare and Medicaid, as, as a percent of the federal government, is about 22 percent, going to go up to 25 percent in the next couple years. We have to find ways that uh, we can reduce uh, the growth of this. Now, I'm going to come back to this later on in my talk because there are some ways that we can look at, and, and I'm going to get more granular on this data. But overall, we're much higher than every other country. So in emergency medicine, we even have more of a perfect storm. Our volumes are increasing. Our revenues are going down in terms of payments from the payers. We have on-call specialty physician shortage. We have inpatient uh, bed shortage, particularly in the critical care beds. The sequester uh, that may or may not come, but if it comes at the end of this week, uh, it's going to have a major effect on our, our volumes because community health centers are going to be taking a big hit in this. Uh, and so, and people are not going to be able to get the, the care they need. Where do they go? They go to the emergency department. MTALA, four nationals, are all affecting our, our operations at a time when our costs are going up. So this is a, important and we've got to find ways again that we can enhance our business and be part of the value-based purchasing methodologies. So what is healthcare, really refor uh, healthcare reform really about? It was really about three aspects. It was about access, quality, and cost. Access to the Accountable Care Act was we're going to provide more people with insurance. Um, and so you, we'll talk about in the next couple slides, the individual mandate, exchanges, expanding Medicaid. But as we know, and the, the experience in Massachusetts, expanding insurance does not necessarily mean that patients have access to health care. What happened in Massachusetts, primary care visits as, as an initial visit grew by three times the weight, grew uh, to get a specialty appointment, doubled. Uh, and ED visits went up because, again, people have insurance. They feel the right, the entitlement to health care. But if they can't get it, they're going to go to the emergency department. It's about quality. So we've seen a, a lot of, of uh, work on improving quality or enhancing quality metrics. The number of quality metrics have markedly increased, including customer service metrics. And it's about cost. And we'll get to that. The real driver in most of this is cost, and we're going to have to find ways to be much more efficient in what we do. Because in the future, we are not going to necessarily be measured, you will not be measured as emergency physicians solely on productivity. In fact, you're going to be measured primarily in the future on the healthcare status of the population that you're managing and your resources that you're utilizing. Uh, and you will start getting measured. Our hospital 
and our physicians are now getting measured down to the detail by diagnosis and if, if you know, our primary care doctors, if they're, they're CHF patients uh, and they get measured against uh, a group of other uh, similar providers, if, they're measure, if their CHF patients are a higher cost, then we can dig down. Is it because you're ordering too many lab tests? Is it more ordering too many expensive uh, drugs or non-generic drugs? Are you, your length of stay, uh, radiology utilization? This will be coming. This will be coming first to the primary care and hospital-based specialties, but it will, but will also get to the, or hospital employed, but it will also get down to the emergency physician level in the future. We've got to start preparing for that. So the Accountable Care Act 5-4 um, decision uh, was affirmed. The Accountable Care Act, you know, basically everything was affirmed except for they couldn't force the states to take federal money, uh, but everything was affirmed in this 5-4 to four decision. And the individual mandate, again, if you're an insurance company, so the state and federal government are the largest insurers in this country, you want to make sure that you can spread your risk. Uh, and that's why the individual mandate is so important, because if you only have sick people getting insurance, that insurance is expensive. And the principle of insurance is that you need to spread that risk. So you need to get healthy people into this as well. And in 2014, when most of the insurance mandates kick in, uh, there were the individual mandate, the first year is only $285 per family, 1% of income, whichever is greater. By 2016, it goes up to almost 2100 or 2.5% of income. And the exchanges, you've heard this uh, mentioned in several of the talks today. This really is an insurance marketplace. Um, and there'll be federal support and a federal plan if states decide not to set up their own exchange. Um, and also states are being asked to expand Medicaid. And basically the government's funding that for the first two years. After that, they'll fund about 90%. But governors uh, are concerned, mainly Republican governors are concerned, about the expenses that will come um, after the first two years, and they also fear that the government will not be paying 90 percent, but will eventually lower that, and more and more of the cost will be transferred to the states. There's a bunch of other insurance um, market stabilization uh, aspects to this legislation. Very complex legislation. Most of it's not being implemented um, right now, and those you know, we can get at our, our regulators right now to try to figure out how, we're, how these are going to get implemented and have some say in how it can get implemented in terms of its effect on emergency medicine. So Medicaid expansion. I had to go to the White House and, and meet with a group of, of other uh, medical society leaders talking with CMS. They really want to push uh, the medical societies and others to, to lead the, the Medicaid expansion in their states. And again, this will be affect individuals at the 133% of federal poverty limit, again, starting next year. A handful of states have elected to do this. About 22 states are deciding not to or haven't made up that decision, again, due to cost concerns. Now, uh, the American College of Emergency Physicians, emergency physicians did work on the Accountable Care Act back in 2010, got some of our emergency care provisions into the language. Cannot require prior authorization for emergency services. Must provide coverage even if those services are not provided by out-of-network providers. Cannot charge higher co-pays or co-insurance for out-of-network um, providers. And again, the, one of the most important is the prudent layperson standard is included in these reforms. If the average individual feels that they have an emergency, they should have the right to go to the emergency department and that visit should be paid for. Now again, how that gets interpreted, you know, particularly on a state level, we keep fighting this all the time, but it's important to have this in the Accountable Care Act, the federal prudent layperson. We work very hard to get that in. So here's sort of the timeline. Uh, the PPACA was, uh, or the Accountable Care Act was passed in 2010. It was affirmed by the election. The election of, of President Obama reaffirmed this uh, health care reform. And uh, as I mentioned, in 2014, most of the insurance reforms are going to go into place. The guaranteed issue, uh, federal rating requirements, and state-based exchanges or expansion of Medicaid will start in less than one year. So what are some of these insurance reforms that we're going to have to look at? Well, there's the mandate. Again, we talked about the individual mandate. 
There's expansion of Medicaid eligibility up to 133% of the federal poverty limit. There'll be these insurance exchanges that will be set up. There are also some good things. Dependents up to age 26 can remain on their parents' policy. A guaranteed issue in renewability. Just because you develop a chronic disease while you're insured, they cannot not renew your insurance. Um, Pre-existing conditions should not be considered in terms of getting insurance. And again, there are some essential health benefits, of which, again, emergency medicine is an essential health benefit in the Accountable Care Act. Again, based on the prudent layperson standard. But what is going to be the effect of all these insurance reforms on the emergency department? Again, if you look at the Massachusetts experience and, and, and others, we're going to see an increase in emergency department visits as these get implemented in the next couple of years. Uh, we don't have a primar enough primary care doctors out there. Um, the subspecialist care will also be hard to get into, although probably not as hard as primary care, a new appointment for primary care. So we will see an increase in emergency department visits. In Massachusetts, they went up 5 to 7 percent in the first year. They somewhat stabilized after that, but again, they've increased. We've got to be prepared for that. So what does the Accountable Care Act do? It will really insure about 32 million more Americans. About half are going to be on Medicaid, the expansion of Medicaid, half in, in the uh, insurance exchanges. 105 will no longer have uh, an insurance limit on their coverage, 105 million. There will still be anywhere from 19, 18, 19 to 27 million, depending on who you look, uh, you listen to, that. Uh, people who are still uninsured. And who are those, who are in that 20 million uninsured? Which groups? Basically two big groups. Illegal aliens, okay. And the other are gonna be healthy young people, the 20 to 30 year olds who aren't on their parents' coverage. You know, insurance is expensive, they're invincible. When you're 20, in your 20s, you're invincible and you don't think you need insurance. And that's going to be the, the people. And those are exactly the people insurance companies want on insurance because they don't use the insurance as much to help spread that risk out. But again, it's going to be important. There will still be in the 20 to 25 million uh, uninsured. And this was a, an article, a, a cartoon, the Republicans, you know, Medicaid now, we already have a plan for the uninsured, and they're dumping it into the emergency department. And uh, if you remember, there were several Republican governors that, uh, that stated, uh, including uh, the presidential candidate, stating that we did have universal health care coverage, we had the emergency department. Um, and we can use that. Uh, it's important. We aren't universal health care coverage, but again, we are a white hat specialty, and we need to be able to use that. So what are the accountable care effects? Uh, payments. As we already mentioned, Medicare payments for Medicaid patients for primary care. This does not include emergency medicine. We tried, but for years and years, for 30 years, we said we were a specialty, and now we can't say we're primary care. So we're, we didn't win this battle. I just read today in one of the daily uh, reports, though, that no, there's not a single state that has, has implemented a policy or procedure for giving Medicare payments for Medicaid right now. Uh, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. This is an independent, right now, um, you get paid based on your, your RVUs, and your RVUs are given so many dollars that's looked at by the RUC committee, which is really part of the AMA. It's all, all the specialties, and ASEP, emergency medicine, is represented at this, and every five years they basically haggle it out how much your RVUs are worth. And emergency medicine is done, done very well. There's a concern that the procedural specialties are, are valued more than cognitive. That's been going on for years. But at least there is physician representation. The IPAB would be an independent board of 15 members that if they decided your RVUs didn't, um, were too high, that emergency medicine is getting paid too much, they could independently just decide that. Um, and then it would be implemented unless there was a, an act through, through the, uh, the legislature to reverse that. But um, as it is right now, it gives them a lot of authority. Now there's also a concern that the IPAB may not because uh, our Medicare per capita growth rate right now is less than the Medicaid target growth rate, 
uh, that this, the iPad may not kick in until 2017 or later. So this may not be as big a threat as people think it could be, but it, if it does come into effect, if, if costs rise higher, IPAB kicks in under the Accountable Care Act, and they could decide what you get paid. There's delivery system reform. Accountable care organizations, bundling of payments, episodes of care. We're going to see this more and more. Um, you know, the ACOs, there's uh, now over 100 that have been approved. Uh, we're going to start seeing this. The problem is, right now, there's not a model on how emergency medicine fits in to bundle payment or accountable care. There isn't a model. Right now, they're carved out. But that's not a long-term strategy. Ultimately, we will not be able to say we need a, a carve-out. We're going to get put into a bundled payment or an ACO, and we've got to start figuring out. It may be negotiated on a hospital-to-hospital -hospital or state-to-state -state basis, but we've got to start proactively thinking how we're going to fit into that rather than a reactive mode. And then quality, again, we have a lot, of, a lot more quality metrics out there, and how does emergency medicine fit into that? What are the emergency medicine quality metrics? Because you will get paid on that. Your hospital will get paid based on your quality metrics, based on your, your customer service scores, your HCAP scores. So it's important how we, f we, we figure that out. There's three things that really weren't addressed well at all in the Accountable Care Act. Sustainable growth rate formula, which is how you get paid. Um, you know, you get paid based on the RVUs, but the SGR was a means to control the number of or the amount of care that's done. It was a very poor metric because it wasn't tied to the health of patients. It was tied to the gross domestic product. So if health care rises more than the gross domestic product, the SGR calls for a cut in payments, in Medicare payments. And so right now, it's about a 30% you know, cut uh, in physician fees. Uh, Medicare. And what happens in Medicare, as you know, happens to the other payers take that on. So the SGR is a major uh, battle right now. It was a $320 billion fix. Because health care costs have come down in this, ne this next year, it's less than that. It's about half of that. It might be time that we start looking at fixing the SGR. Liability reform was not really tackled at all in the Accountable Care Act. There's $50 million for, for demonstration projects, but that's not sufficient. We need to have liability reform. Price Waterhouse Cooper study in 2007 said there was $200 billion in waste due to defensive medicine. That is a huge cost. We need to be looking at that. And end of life care. What happened when we started mentioning end of life care in the Accountable Care Act? What was the term used? Death, Death panels, right? Even my, I got a call from my dad thinking I was going to put them down. Um, <laughs> you know. I heard after 70, they're not going to let me get hospitalized. Eh, that's not exactly it. But we need to have this conversation. I'm going to show you a slide later why we need to have this conversation. But 5% of the population spends 21% of the health care dollar. 20% spends 70% of the health care dollar. And that's usually in the last few months of life. We've got to start having this discussion. That is a huge cost to the system. And I'm going to show you later why that is. So here's the formula for value in healthcare. Value equals quality divided by cost plus service excellence. So the way to enhance value is to improve your quality, to improve your customer service, and we're doing that. And that's what your quality metrics are, your HCAP scores. But the biggest driver is going to be cost. We've got to look at reducing cost. And the only way we're going to be doing that with with all the, the increased number of patients is to become much more efficient and manage that cost, or manage those patients, manage those patients' care. So what is the value of emergency medicine? So, so when, you know, for 25 years I've, I've been in organized emergency medicine, and what, when you go out and talk with, with your legislators, what do they think about emergency medicine? What are the negatives? I mean, they, they actually do get that we take care of sick people and, and get that, but what I've heard for 25 years were expensive and we have too many unnecessary patients there. And your legislators, no matter, you know, even some of the more enlightened ones still think that. Um, so we do provide a huge amount of value right now. We can reduce potentially avoidable admissions or reduce uh, readmissions. You've heard some of the strategies for doing that. We can become the rapid diagnostic center. One of the things that I don't think we get enough credit for is reducing what's called the patient cycle time, reduce time off from work, reduce pain and anxiety. Again, if they saw their primary care doctor, you know, the, the old uh, 
Greg Henry or Tom Mayers, you know, you're going to be here six hours for your abdominal pain, but I'm going to be able to do 10 days worth of work. Because again, they'd have to make an appointment with the primary care doctor. That takes two, three days. They go and see them. They'd order a blood test. You get the next day. CT scan, you get two, three days later. And then you make an appointment three days later to see them. We can all do that. And, you know, we get people back to work much sooner. Uh, we can reduce unnecessary testing. I'm, that's, I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow. Um, we provide disaster and uh, preparation and syndromic surveillance. We can do regionalization of care. And we are, you know, a potential interface with the value-based mainstream strategies such as accountable care uh, organizations or episodes of care. That's where we, that's a gap right now that we can really fill that I think we're going to need to. So, um, the, the, the value of emergency care. So emergency physicians comprise 4% of all physicians. And we spend anywhere from 2 to 4% of all the healthcare dollar. Now we used to say 2%, and we used to be very proud of that. But, but now as we look going into an ACO and negotiating what our payment was, you know, I'm not sure we want to say we're only 2% of your dollar. So, you know, we're, we're in a catch-22 right now in some ways. But we still provide tremendous value. We provide 28% of all ambulatory care visits. We provide two-thirds of, of under and uninsured ambulatory care visits. And we provide 70% of visits after hours. That's a huge value for just 4% of, of the physician workforce. We provide huge value. We always have to dispel myths that, you know, these patients don't need to be here. And this was uh, in July, um, Health System's uh, research brief that uh, Medicaid patients, they come in, when they come in, they, and they do utilize the emergency department more. Why do Medicaid patients utilize the emergency department more? Okay, number one, because they got chronic disease in the adult population. That's why they're on Medicaid. You know, in, in, in the pediatric population, it's a little bit different, but in the adult population, so they visit for more urgent symptoms. And then the Smallwoods article that came out around the same time said, you know, the way to, that we can affect costs, what percent of, emer of hospital admissions now come through the emergency department? Nationwide, it's, we went over 50% a couple years ago, about 55% of all hospital admissions now come through the emergency department. It didn't used to be that way. My hospital is 95%. So the way we can really affect change and reduce costs is affecting those admissions. How we can better manage those patients, keep them well, keep them out of the hospital. That's the way, not, not trying to prevent lower acuity patients from coming to our emergency department. That's such a small dollar amount. We have a huge impact on who gets admitted, and we need to start using that influence, that power, in, in how we're perceived. What I'd like to see is the emergency department as the center of the hub, that, that you know, we're a fixed cost. We have to be open 24 hours a day no matter what. We have to have lab, we have to have nurses, we have to have radiology. When you have a large fixed cost, you want to try to utilize that as much as possible. I'd like to see us as, a, as the, the center of the hub, the, the hub of the enterprise. We can deal with the medical home, we can deal with urgent care, the primary care doctors, uh, nursing home, the specialists. We could help coordinate care. We have access, I already mentioned, to 136 million, 130 million visits. We should use that access Instead of being an island where, you know, we just get send people and we send them out, we could be a bridge to the primary care doctor, the ambulatory setting, um, and the inpatient. We could be that bridge and also to value-based purchase methodologies, get them into their medical home, uh, get them into the community health center, start integrating that care much better. We've got to start doing that. If we don't, the payers and government are going to take patients out of our emergency department and they're going to tell us how to practice. So, you know, when I became president, I really tried to focus on transitions of care. You can look at transitions of care a couple of ways. One is, you know, the transition from the emergency department to the inpatient. And we have a group working on that. How to communicate better, you know, because there's a lot of miscommunications and breakdown in care often occurs at that transfer. But I also want to look at the outpatient transitions of care. Again, we have access to 130 million patients, and there's probably 130 million visitors that come with that patient. 
okay? That's, a, that's two thirds of the population comes through our emergency department uh, each year. We need to use that access to look at what I call part of the medical neighborhood. Could we be doing prevention, immunization, wellness screening, um, disease management, chronic disease, palliative care. I'm going to talk each uh, about these a little bit more. But I think it's imperative that we start looking at managing this patient. You've already heard some talks today. Dr. Clower talked about, you know, the, the high utilizer uh, patient. You've heard about observation units. We need to look at these are ways that we fit into a value-based purchasing methodology, how we enhance our value. because. Again, to, the real key is controlling cost. And so managing these patients more efficiently is going to be the way that we can fit into this. So if you looked at value-based healthcare through the years, we've moved from a transactional model. I see a patient, I do a procedure, I get paid for that. To a more of an episodic episodes of care. And there's been a couple demonstration projects. Um, the, the biggest ones are hip replacement and coronary artery bypass graft, but they're going to start developing more episodes of care. We're going to start moving into a, a condition care model where you start managing not only cancer or di diabetes, asthma on a chronic disease or condition um, uh, model. And uh, we're eventually going to move into population-based health care where you look at, you, you will be responsible for a population, and you will get measured, as I mentioned, on the wellness, how well that population is, and how many resources they consume or don't consume. That's how you're going to get measured in the future. Productivity will always be important. Customer service, quality metrics will always be important. But we're going to be moving. The government's moving to a more population health-based model, and we've got to see how we can fit into that. So the medical home, again, medical home is great in theory. We just don't have enough medical homes, don't enough, have enough primary care doctors out there. So we've got to look about cost-effective emergency care. Again, I'm going to talk more specifically about testing tomorrow, but other ways that we can fit in, you know, almost one-third of discharged Medicare patients were hospitalized within 90 days. So now the government's not going to pay for 30-day readmissions. Um, you know, a lot of studies will show that we really don't have the ability to affect 30 days. Uh, we have maybe 72 hours to seven days that we, we as healthcare providers can control, because once they get out, it's hard to control that. But they, they want to get people in to see the primary care. They want to make sure that they get their, their medications, that they're followed up. We can look at how can we help with that in emergency medicine. Well, one, you've already heard uh, Jay Sure talk about observation units. Uh, run by emergency medicine, available 24-7, separate staffing is a way that we can help reduce readmissions, potentially avoidable admissions, and reduce cost to the system. It can also be a revenue generator for your emergency department and can actually even reduce some of your nurse staffing. Now again, some of the issues we're facing on this right now that ASAP's working on, one is the co-payments for observation unit. The, payment, the patient gets all these co-pays. Um, and it can be very expensive for the patient. We're trying to get CMS to, to understand this and streamline their rules for this. The other is the three-day observation, which Jay mentioned. Um, you can't go into a nursing home unless you have a three-day stay uh, in a hospital. Observation doesn't count in that. We're gonna, trying to get CMS to get rid of the three-day rule because, again, it's cost savings. We're trying to be proactive in saving money for the, uh, for the health care system. Again, care coordination is going to be the, the cornerstone. Again, it's the cornerstone of accountable care organizations, going to be for readmissions and episodes of care. And we have to fit into that. What I fear is you have a patient that needs to be admitted, and you've now got the hospital and the primary care doctor on the side is, I don't, we don't want you to admit them because we're not going to get paid. And you've got to be that patient advocate. Again, one way is the observation unit that we can do, but again, we've got to change some of the payment rules. So decreased uh, cost for chronic care. Um, I don't think that's me. My phone's over there. <laughs> um, decrease for chronic uh, care. We've got to do better case management, which I'm going to talk about. But how many of you are using community paramedics now? Anybody? A couple of you. Um, we're going to start doing this in, in Chattanooga, uh, where I'm at, in using uh, paramedics to go out and check on, 
on patients, particularly chronic disease patients, the, the high utilizers that Kevin Clower were talking about. We're going to go out, CHF patients, we're going to, met, we're going to go have the paramedics weigh them. We're going to have them take their blood pressures, make sure they got their medications filled. Um, go out and, and, and talk with them because sometimes there's a lot of downtime in the system, particularly we're going to use our, our supervisors and we're going to limit it to, again, high utilizers. But we're, a lot of communities are now using their paramedics or developing community paramedics to check on chronic patients or frequent, you know, frequent ER users. Increased efficiency of primary care. Now the problem, you know, we could, we could look at doing acute, and we do acute care, but, you know, there are now emergency departments, and I just did an interview last week about emergency departments that are, are giving appointments in their emergency department. Um, and so you can schedule an appointment. Uh, again, we have those high fixed costs. We should utilize the heck out of our emergency department. Um, so, you know, looking at primary care, we can increase the efficiency of primary care. Again, we have to have that communication, that common EM, uh, electronic medical record that will provide that information but we can really enhance primary care. Now, one of the problems that we have is our payment model. Um, you know, yeah, we get $37 for that sore throat, and then the hospital throws a $400 facility fee on them. We've got to look at a new model of payment if we're going to do primary care in the emergency department. There are some groups that, that have, like, an urgent care and an emergency department, and they can see them in the urgent care. There's a couple groups in Minnesota I know are doing that. But we've got to look at a different model on how to do this. But we should be able to do this. Again, we've got high fix, fixed costs. We, our variable costs are not nearly what, what our fixed costs are. We should be using this more. Um, uh, increased prevention, uh, preventative care. Um, this is going to be important. Uh, immunizations, education, high-risk behavior, mental health screening. Uh, we, we could look at b providing more preventative care. Decreased costs for chronic care. Most of you, I think, probably have increased your, your case managers in your emergency department. Five years ago, we didn't have any. Now we've got, we've got more. We've got social workers. We're looking, you know, the problem in the emergency department is you don't want to do it in the emergency department. You want to create an area around the emergency department for, to do this, and most of us don't have space around our emergency departments. Uh, but, again, managing uh, care in the emergency department or surrounding the emergency department. Those high-risk patients, high-cost patients, chronic illness. We, you know, there are some that have a discharge center now where actually nurses call the patients the next day and make sure that they make their appointment, make sure that they have transportation, make sure that they're getting their prescriptions filled. We have a huge ability to help with that. Decreased cost for chronic care, you heard Dr. Janiak talk about telemedicine. We look at daycares, prisons, nursing homes. We should be expanding the use of this. We're going to start using this for our rural emergency departments um, and be a, a resource uh, using telemedicine. Um, it's going to be a growth industry. It's going to be a way that, again, we can enhance our value and decrease the cost for care. So I wanted to add the last few slides to talk about end-of-life care and how we can look at this in the emergency department. So remember the graph I showed where the U.S. was way ahead of everybody in per capita and GDP? Well, when you really look at it by age, we're exactly in line with all the other countries until about age 57. And then look what happens. We just skyrocket. So for those of you 57 here or older, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but we need to look at this. I'm getting there soon, too. But um, you need to look at, we need to look at this. Again, other countries have figured this out. They figured it out. We need to have this discussion. So how can the emergency department be more involved? Um, you look at, at, at disease presentation. There's curative therapy, and then there's the non-curative symptom management, which is palliative, palliative care. And then, then, then there's a, you know, end-of-life care before before death. We could fit in end-of-life care by doing pulse, making sure that patients have advanced directives. We should be consulting or getting patients, especially with chronic disease, in palliative care. So we're having discussions with the Palliative Care Society. We're having discussions with Society for Hospitalist Medicine on how to do this better. But we have that opportunity. Um, again, I'm not sure emergency medicine wants to take the lead on this because of the fear of death panels, but as a country, we need to start having this discussion, and I think emergency physicians, emergency medicine can fit into this. 
We're actually looking at a strategy at ASEP, you know, starting off with education, core curriculum, a PR, implement this in, in our transitions of care plan and delivery system reform, and then do uh, some advocacy efforts. So we've got a plan, but we need to start fitting into this if we're going to reduce costs. So there are some requ requirements for all the things I talked about. We need to talk about cost as opposed to charge-based decision making, and I think we're going to be moving into more of a population-based health. We have to have a transparent EMR that it connects all services. Without that, we're not going to be as efficient as we need to be. And this is a real sticking point with many health centers or many, many health systems is the interconnectivity of the EMRs. It has to be data driven. And again, we're starting to do this with our hospital employed at my hospital and my system. Uh, we're going to be looking, there's programs out there that can look at all the resources that you're consuming based on diagnosis, patient age, um, data driven, and you will get measured on this in the future, I guarantee it. Uh, again, we have to have some reimbursement for care management. Right now, emergency medicine is excluded. There is a, there is a, a, uh, a, a CPT or uh, a charge that you can do for care management but not for emergency medicine. We need to look at fitting into that. And again, workforce requirements. What are our workforce? Again, we may not have enough emergency physicians. Um, we've got a large group of PAs, uh, other specialty trained that are working out in rural areas. How do they fit into emergency medicine? We've got to figure that out. So real quick, some other issues. I've already talked about some of the reimbursement, um, Medicaid expansion, how we fit into that, the SGR. But again, we're going to be moving away from a fee-for-service, and so how do we fit into that? Quality, uh, we're going to look at reduced testing. I'm going to talk about cost-effective emergency care tomorrow. Uh, but again, improving the patient experience, cost-effective emergency care, and liability is going to, again, be a big issue. Um, you know, ASEP sort of put their money behind, you know, putting, giving us the protection that the, the public health service providers do, which means you move from civil court to federal claims court, which may or may not be great because you don't have control of it once it gets to federal claims. If we really want to change how we practice, I think we need to give um, safe harbors for using best practices. So, you know, the, the cost effect emergency care, the choosing wisely, if you use that, that you, if you make a good faith effort in using those, that you're protected. Right now, right now, any safe harbors you have can easily be gotten around by lawyers, uh, but we need to you know, ha look at, in my opinion, looking at safe harbors, because that's the only way you're going to change physician behavior, because we've trained at least two generations or more of physicians to order tests rather than examine the patient. And if we're going to really change physician behavior, we need to be doing that. And I'm guilty, I'm a dean, I've been in education my whole life, but, but we need to you know, look at if we want to change phys physician practices. So anyway, I, I hope I've given you a little bit of an overview and I didn't really get us back on time too much, but uh, thank you very much for the invitation.